been on my heart for a long time. I haven't preached in about a, about a month. And unfortunately, also the next two weeks we're going to have guests, but then everything will be back on schedule for a while. Um, but God, what, the good news about whenever God tells me to take time out of the pulpit is by the time it's time for me to be back in, I'm always loaded uh, with, with so much stuff that God has been sharing. I've got pages and pages of notes that I'm going to be sharing with you all over the next several weeks. I bet some of you all thought today, but no, not today. I'm just going to kind of pop the cork today a little bit. I'm just going to kind of o- open, open the, the bottle just a little bit. and uh, Just real quickly, it's so, I'm so thankful for the guests that came today, um, for Pastor Carol and Sister Carol. I didn't even see you all. Um, God bless you, India and Brittany, my mom. Uh, so many friends and family came out today. Um, it's not theoretically, technically my birthday. That's not until Tuesday, but I am thankful that people thought enough of me to come and visit um, from Bowling Green and all over, so so grateful for that. But the message today is impending revival. It's a term that you heard our youth pastor say a little while ago, and that is actually going to be the title of every message I preach for several weeks, is impending revival. And when something is impending, it means it's at hand, it's coming, it's certain. But I want to read a verse to you in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And I'm just going to preach one verse today, which is not my style. Now, I'll be quoting some others, but this one verse is where I'm going to hang everything on. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, I want to give you a little context to this verse. Okay, because Israel had been wandering around the wilderness for decades, worshiping in a tent. They were having tent meetings, setting up and tearing down. Everywhere they went, they would pack this tent around until God gave them this land that he had promised them, this land that would be flowing with milk and honey, this land that would belong to them, that would belong to God's people, the land of Israel. And they had been there for a while, and then there was uh, King Saul, King David, and then King Solomon. Now, God had put in King David's heart, I want to build a permanent temple. I want to build a place that people can marvel over how amazing you are. And God said, no, you've got blood on your hands. You've done some evil things, and I'm going to let your son build it. So David said, okay, I'm going to run a capital campaign. I'm going to raise the money. And he raised all the money, and then Solomon was born, and then Solomon builds this glorious temple. He gets all the furnishings in there, and then they bring the Ark of Presence, that Ark that represented the presence of God. And they bring it into this newly built temple with all the elaborate ornaments and all the elaborate furniture that God told them to make uh, covered in bronze, covered in gold. This, this thing must have been a marvel to see. So they had this thing all built up, and then it was the day to dedicate it, and everyone was excited. The worship team had been practicing for months and months and months and months, getting ready. Yes, they had worship teams back then. They had a band. The band was prepared. If you don't believe me, read prior to this verse. The band was, was amped. They were ready. The atmosphere was set. The ministers were excited. The sacrifices were pouring in by the thousands. People were ready. And then the presence of God showed up in that place. It says the glory of God fell like a cloud, and the priests couldn't even stand up to minister. They were trying to offer the sacrifices, and the glory of God was so thick and so heavy and so prominent in that place, they couldn't even get off the ground to minister. And all this settled down, and then Solomon gets up and recognizes that God was in the place. He offers this prayer of dedication and says, God, we belong to you. We are your people. We will worship you. You alone are God, and we give you glory. And then the band struck up again, and they had a joyous worship service like never seen before, followed by seven days of celebration, and then one day of a solemn assembly. And after this solemn assembly, the people of Israel gathered one last time, and that's when God shared these words. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, why would God give them this promise? And if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, you don't have to turn there. But Deuteronomy chapter 28, when God is establishing the people of Israel, when they're still in the wilderness, he gives them this promise. He says, if you do what I say, then these blessings will pursue you and overtake you. He says, you'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the country, you'll be blessed when you come, 
you'll be blessed when you go. It says you'll be the head, not the tail, the front, not the back, the lender, not the borrower. Even the fruit of your womb shall be blessed if you obey me. And then God said, but if you disobey and don't listen to the laws and decrees that I've given you, then you'll be the last and not the first. You'll be the back, not the front. You'll be cursed in the city. You'll be cursed in the country. You're, the fruit of your womb will be cut. These things will chase you down and overtake you. And see, God gives promises most of the time conditionally. Now, there are certain promises God gives that are certain. Jesus is going to come back. Amen? There are going to be people at the end that are going to be saved. Those are promises that are going to happen because they're ultimately part of God's framework of his ultimate plan for his people. <clears throat> But most promises when it pertains to us and receiving anything from him have what is called an if and a then principle. If you do this, then this will happen. Now, one thing about the if and then principle that I want you to grasp this morning is if we do the if, the then is certain. If, then. So God says, if my people... Who are called by my name. Now, what's his name? That wasn't a trick question. What's his name? Amen. So we call on the name of Jesus. We sang about him today. We talked about him. He is the focal point, the star of the show, the headliner, Jesus. Amen. We talk about him. We lift him up. And he says, if my people who call on my name. He's not talking about the world. He's not talking about Washington. He's not talking about the president or the senators or the Congress or the House. He is talking about his people. Now, contextually, his people in the Old Testament, we're talking about Jews or, or not necessarily Jews, but Hebrews, because we know that Jews were actually just one branch of the Hebrews, the, Ju uh, the, the Judites, the, the Lion of Judah, and those who they called proselytes. They were people who converted to Judaism but they were from other nations. Those were his people. Now, we translate that to New Testament. And who are his people? It's still Jews and proselytes. It's just now through the name of Jesus, and we make up what is called his church. Now, I'm not saying the church has replaced Israel in any form or any way. Israel still stands as God's people. We are just simply grafted together with them, and we make one people who call on one name, and that is the name of Jesus, by which all men shall be saved. So if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So if we do four things that I'm going to break down really fast, then there are three things we can count on. Because if God says if and then, we can write it down if we take care of the gift. The problem is too many of us don't take care of the if, we only expect the then. Can I tell you something? It's easy to be spiritual. It's hard to be disciplined. I'm going to say that again. It's easy to be spiritual. It's hard to be disciplined. It's easy to cry in God's presence. It's hard to carry out that which he's spoken to your heart out in the world when the enemy's attacking and everything's working against you. It's easy to fall in his presence. It's easy to shout in his presence. It's easy to smile. In his, it's easy to be spiritual. It's hard to be disciplined. So when it comes time to take care of the if, that's where many of us fail. But we're not going to. We're not going to. Four ifs, God said. Number one if, he said, if my people who call by my name will humble themselves. There's tons of ways in the Bible to humble yourselves. There is repentance. There is mourning. There is submitting to authority. Oh, not in the Pentecostal church, baby. Do you realize it's humility to come to someone and say, lead me? Well, I can hear from God just as good as you can, pastor. You may be able to, but God gave me this role, not you. I'm not, I'm, I am unashamed of the call of God that he has placed on my life. And I will walk in it with full, that's the word I was looking for. I was searching confidence. Because I was thinking authority, but that wasn't the right word, so thank you. In full confidence, knowing that God has given me the equipment to lead this congregation. Not only has he given me the equipment to lead this congregation, he has put people in my life. Surrounded me with good women and good men 
that will help me be accountable. Humble themselves. Submitting to authority, taking the lowest place, saying, no, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. Serving others instead of expecting to be served. So many more. But the way I want to focus on humbling ourselves today is the humbling of ourselves through fasting. Now, I want you all to put those verses on the screen. Ezra 8, 21. Ezra 8, 21. And what does it say? Then I proclaimed to fast there at the river Hava, that we may humble ourselves before God, to seek from him safe journeys for ourselves, our children, and our goods. Go to the next one in Psalm. But I... When they were sick, I wore sackcloth and afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed on the chest. Go to the next one. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. Now, am I saying if you do not fast, you are not humbling yourself? Absolutely not. But I am saying that fasting is a way to humble ourselves. And that is the reason why we take this approach on occasion at this church. We humble ourselves with fasting. Jesus didn't say, if you fast, if you feel like fasting, or one day you might want to fast. He said, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't try to make yourself look all sad and, and, and starving and hungry. You put oil on your head. You put a smile on your face. You walk tall, and you act like God is helping you. Don't be like the hypocrites. Jesus commanded that his people would fast. John the Baptist, disciples, fast and prayed often. And some of them came and said, why do the, the apostles of John or the followers of John Fast, but yet your people don't. And Jesus said, can they fast when the bridegroom's with them? Ain't nobody going to fast during a wedding, dummy. Jesus said, there's going to come a day that I'm going to go, then they'll fast. I believe the time is now. When you notice when times of fasting and prayer were called, it was times of political uncertainty, times of crisis, and times where God's people needed an answer. One of the greatest examples of a three-day fast is in the book of Esther. When Esther, uh, the, the people of God, the Jews or the Hebrews, were facing extermination from an evil empire. And Esther called the people to fast for three days and call on God. And we know, if you don't know the story, God intervened. They were spared. Don't have time to go into it. Folks, probably a good idea that you read your Bible. Because I can't preach the whole thing. Humbling ourselves. Fasting is a form of self-denial and humbling ourselves before God. It is God, I'm going to give you the thing I enjoy the most. Because one thing I know about Pentecostal people is, man, we love us some food. I think we got the Baptist licked as far as our love of food. We like to eat. So when we say, God, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to deny myself of something that I love, Because I want you more than I want food. Something about that level of humility captures the attention of God. Some of you may have health issues. Some of you may have, like I said, you may be nursing or you may be pregnant. And please use wisdom. Also, if you fast for three days, please drink lots and lots and lots of water. Okay, lots of it. Some of you may need to take some juice because you have some demanding jobs, and after a couple of days, you start feeling weak, and we don't want you passing out at work. Okay, some of you may just decide to do a meal or two meals or or whatever you choose to do. Look, here's the thing. You commit to something, and then don't let people make you beat you down. Well, that isn't enough. That's not a true fast. If you are sacrificing and humble yourself before God, he's going to respond. Amen? You don't worry. Now, some of us can do the greatest level of discipline by denying ourselves food, denying ourselves pleasure, and denying ourselves enjoyment. And uh, even the Bible says husbands and wives don't come together uh, or or come together all the time except for during a season of fasting. So some people even give that up during, hey, I'm just talking real. Amen? If it's in the word, it's going to come out of my mouth. Can't hold back like fire shut up in my bones. Amen? So some of us can even withhold ourselves from things like that. Now, don't do like Beth and I did before we were married. We gave up sex for Lent. We weren't even married. It's like, we're going to give up sin for a week. But you should do that already because you're saved. Amen? <laughs> so the first thing is humble yourselves. God says if we humble ourselves, if we put others first, 
and we submit ourselves to authority, if we take the lowest place and always uh, look for the good of others, if we practice repentance and we mourn and we uh, set the example of humility, if you win the humility prize and wear it, you probably need help with your humility. I won the, hum- I won the humble award. That's not how it works. Number two thing he said is seek my face. Now, seeking his face is distinct from praying. See, when we seek his face, there is something about face-to-face conversation. You know what I mean? It's like when we got something to deal with and we deal with it over text message, which is the way of this generation, how many times are we misunderstood? How many times do we not quite get the language correct because they can't see our face? There's something about our face. I can say the word, come here, and it can mean so many different things. Come here. Come here. Come here. (laughs) See, that face means everything. So God's saying, seek my face, seek my presence. I want you to know what I mean. I don't just want you to hear. See, that's what happens. When we read the Bible and we listen to his words without seeking his face, we have no idea what he's talking about. See, I know because I used to read this Bible as an unsaved man. And I felt beat to death all the time. Because I knew that I couldn't measure up. I knew I wasn't right with him. But when I found his face, when I found his presence, when I could speak to him, knowing his heart and seeking his face, something changed. You notice it doesn't say to seek his hand. It doesn't say to seek his promises. It says to seek his face. Face Face-to-face contact is among the most intimate and personal contact you can have with a person. And it's a signal of complete unity and complete oneness. God, help us to seek your face. Help us to hunger for your presence. Do you know, now I'm going to say this as carefully as I can, that human beings are the only people that can mate face-to-face. Why? Because God designed us to have more than just raw passion, but intimacy. And that's what God wants from us. He wants intimacy. He wants face-to-face contact. He wants us to be able to seek his face, to look into his face, and capture his heart, and hunger for his presence so that we can know him. I cannot know a person without seeing their face. So many people get catfished on Facebook. Is that the right term? Okay. That's where the person is fake. They put a fake face up there, and you think you're talking to a person, and then when you meet them, it's like... And then sometimes the person don't even exist. It's a whole fake profile. So God wants us to know him face to seek my face. Lord, I hunger for face-to-face contact with you. Lord, I don't want to just talk about you. I want to talk to you. I want to be with you. I want to hunger for your presence. So if I humble myself and I seek his face, not just his benefits, not just his hand, not just what he can do for me, Lord, I want you. Then he says, and pray. Two different things. Prayer represents a hunger to know God better. But it's also in prayer that you can bring your requests to him. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. God wants to hear our requests. He wants to know what we want. He wants to know our desires, even though he already knows Anybody ever had your children tell you something you already know about, but you sit there and listen to it because it's your kid, and you want them to know that you're interested in them, even though I already know this. Daddy, do you know two plus two is four? Since I was your age, of course. And just these little simple things they want to reveal to us that's so mind-blowing to them, but yet so simple to us, and we want to hear it because they're our children. So God wants us to pray. Now, this is the one, whenever you hear this verse quoted, is the most often left off part. 
You often hear this verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, and pray, then I will hear from heaven. It's like, no, 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 wait. Wait. You forgot something. Turn from their wicked ways. When you hear this verse quoted, this is often left out. But I'm here to tell you, we can humble ourselves through fasting, through putting others first, through submitting to leadership, through all the means, mourning and whatever you, you, you want to say. We can ask for God's presence and we can pray until we're near starvation and exhaustion. But if we are wicked, his presence will not come. The Bible says, know you not, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God dwells within you. And that's what he says, what fellowship has light with darkness? We cannot have fellowship with darkness and call ourselves light. Now, I'm not going to give you a list of things. But I'm here to tell you, if you're partying all week, and then you're relying on Sunday to make you right with God, you need to repent. If you're living like hell all week, doing whatever you want all week, and you're relying on a sermon on Sunday to rescue your soul from hell, you are sadly mistaken. It is time for God's people to repent. But I'm going to pick on some things that are a little more common. Because I'm going to assume that most of us are good enough to know to at least sober up by Friday so we can repent all day on Sunday or Saturday. So we come to church on Sunday, then we can say, oh, no, I don't do that no more, Pastor. Blaine, I told you I was going to need help on point number four. Remember? <laughs> My amen, buddy. But let me ask you some questions. Does the music you listen to indicate a hunger for God's presence? Thank you. I told you I was going to need help on point four. I was telling you the truth. Do you listen to music that is filled with sexual innuendos, foul words, things that speak against God, things that speak against unity in this country, things that speak against authority and against all the things we're supposed to stand for? Do your habits on television reflect a hunger for the presence of God in your life? Or do they contain sexuality, nudity, bad language, rebellion, parents that are the idiots and kids that are the smart ones? And who's always the dumbest one in the movie? The daddy. I'm going to tell you something. I ain't no dumb daddy. The TV is lying. And it's time for daddies to step up and be the men of God God has called them to be and stand at the door of their house with the sword of the Spirit flared up and with their armor full and ready and saying, Satan, you ain't getting in my door. You want my wife? You want my kids? Then buck up, baby, because you got to come right here. You might as well go on next door because this house is armed and ready. Do the TV shows you watch indicate a desire for holiness? Do the videos you watch on YouTube, Voodoo, Hulu, Netflix, Vimeo, there's more. They indicate a desire for holiness. Does your social media and internet activities uh, indicate a desire for the hunger of God? See, we may not do the big things. We not, may not be at the club Saturday night and at the church Sunday morning. But we'll let our guard down to the TV because we see that's fake. That's not real. You wouldn't believe how many Christians. Oh, I'm about to get on a soapbox and get in trouble. We wouldn't be how many Christians. Now, I'm going to be very careful because I'm not trying to send a condemning tone to people that may not understand. But if the movies you watch are laced with witchcraft, are laced with evil, are fascinated with death and the occult? If the movies you watch have sexual nudity, sexual content that is... Those folks ain't even married in most cases. Even in the TV show, but especially in real life. And you say, well, they're just pretending. Can I tell you that's a real woman taking her real clothes off and showing her real body to a real person? We can call it fake all day, but it's sinful. Romans chapter 1. 
I can't remember exactly where it was, and I don't remember if I wrote it down in my text. I'm just going to turn there. When y'all see me using unprepared Bible verses that I didn't even write down, you know it's getting real. Romans chapter 1, somewhere around verse 30, I think. And the Bible is talking about the judgment of God that's coming upon his people. Verse 32, I was close. It says, though they know God's righteousness decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. What we watch on television tells us what we approve. Because I'm here to tell you, if a man was to walk up in my living room, grab up his lover, and make love to her, or whatever you call that junk when you ain't saved, in my living room, in front of my kids, saying all kinds of words I don't approve of, I would kick their naked behind so far down the street, they wouldn't even remember their names. But let it come through a television screen. And am I willing to compromise? I'm willing to cover my eyes. Oh, it's not a big deal. They're just acting. That's a real woman. How a Christian can watch Game of Thrones. I, I read an article by John Piper on Game of Thrones, and I have no reason to question its credibility. I do not have the channel, never seen the show. But if you are watching Game of Thrones, you need to turn from your wicked ways. Nudity has no place outside of the wedding bed in a sexual manner. I understand sometimes you got to undress for your doctor, and sometimes you got to help your kids take a bath and things like that. I feel like I have to over-explain things because, you know. <laughs> but I am here to tell you that light has no fellowship with darkness in any form. Make believe, entertain. Our fascination with zombies, our fascination with vampires, our fascination with witches, our fascination with all these things, it is evil in the sight of God. Notice I didn't name any movies. You can plug in your own blanks. But I'm here to tell you, it is time for God's people to turn from their wicked ways. Do you want the then? We've got to handle the if. We cannot sit at the table of demons and drink from the cup of God. It is not going to work. Folks, it is time for God's people to repent. Now, I know that fourth one was harsh, but I'm ready to bring this thing home. Because God says, if you will do these four things, if you will humble yourself, if you'll seek my face, if you will pray, and if you will turn from your wicked ways, then God gives us three certainties, three absolute ends that are bound to occur. Number one, he says, I will hear. See, God hears everything. Make no mistake, God hears absolutely everything. There's nothing God doesn't hear. But there is a difference when you're sitting in a playground with a bunch of children. Children everywhere, and all these children are talking. It's like I hear that child uh, crying out a little bit in the background, and, and, and it's fine. Please don't feel like you've got to take crying children out here. I can talk louder than them. Because we want you to be able to hear the Word of God. And I can hear people breathing and thinking and talking and, 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 and all these things. I feel the wheels turning in the place. But there's something different. A couple weeks ago, Brittany fell on the floor. And all of a sudden, my hearing changed because I only heard one thing. I heard that thud. And then I responded. Because it's different. And see, God says, when you do these things, when you humble yourself, when you seek my face, when you pray, and when you turn from your wicked ways, God says, I'm going to hear. It's like hearing all these voices, and all of a sudden, there's one that commands your attention. There's that one that calls your name, Dad. And all of a sudden, my focus turns to that one person. So I'm not indicating that God does not hear everything, but what I am indicating is when we do these things, we have God's full attention. He is paying attention, and he's listening to us exclusively. This is a face-to-face -face hearing, a face-to-face -face response. So number one, God says, I will hear. I love God's response to the people of Israel, which weren't really Israel yet, in Exodus chapter 3. They've been crying out 400 years of slavery, and God came to Moses in the bush, and he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
And he said, I have heard your cries, and I have come to help. It's a different kind of hearing, folks. It's when all of a sudden you're talking face to face, and God says, I'll hear you. I know I'm not the only one in this place that wants God to hear me like that. For he says, I've heard your voice, and I'm here to help. Second thing, and I believe this is one of the more beautiful things in the whole text. He says, I will forgive your sin. See, look, no matter what you did last year, last month, last week, last night, just a few minutes ago, or whatever, if you say, God, I humble myself, I seek your face, I pray, and Lord, I'm turned away from these wicked things that I've been participating in, he's going to hear and he's going to forgive. So folks, don't sit here beating yourself to death. Don't sit here worrying about whether or not God can hear you. That's all you have to do is say, God, I turn from these evil things. I repent. The word repent just means to turn away from, to turn your back to. Folks, we all sometimes need to repent. We all sometimes need to turn away from some things. I have a tendency to get an attitude sometimes. I mean, you cross me up, I'm liable to cop a toot. Right? And sometimes that toot can last a while. And then I go back and do this thing called sulking and brooding, where I'm planning up how I'm going to get you. Then the Holy Spirit comes in and says, turn from your evil ways. And I have a choice. I can give in to that thing, or I can humble myself. I can seek his face. I can pray, and I can turn from, his evil way, from, from my evil ways and say, God, I want you. I want you to hear me. I want you to forgive me. So I'm here to tell you that forgiveness is available the moment you turn from evil. But folks, it is time to stop playing games with God. Jesus is coming back for his church. And the timeline is not super clear. In fact, Jesus himself, while he was on this planet, says the sun does not even know the time, the day, or the hour. Now, if I'm waiting for somebody, and I know they're coming soon because they told me, but I don't know exactly when they're coming, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be participating in things that I know that the object of my affection hates and risk losing that opportunity like the ten foolish virgins who forgot to put oil in their lamp and waited until the last minute, then went out in town to buy it, and the bridegroom came, and they missed the wedding. Again, you need to read the Word. I don't have time to explain all this. But the last then. He says, I will heal the land. Now, I want to tell you a quick little story about when the Israelites first went into Egypt. See what happened is there was a famine in the land, and Joseph had been left for dead by his brothers, but ultimately he ended up in Egypt. This can be found in the book of Genesis. And his brothers, not knowing the welfare of Joseph, but they knew there was food in Egypt because Joseph had given, given Pharaoh this incredible plan during this famine that they had food. So Abraham sent the kids to Egypt. They went back with food, and, but things kept going wrong, and it was because Joseph had the game rigged. He knew who they were. And I'm going to shorten up this story, but basically, once Joseph reveals to his brothers who he is, he says, go get my father. Bring him here. I'm going to take care of him. And they put them in this land called Goshen. Some of you may not already know where I'm going. And then in this land of Goshen, they stayed there for a while. And then God wanted to set his people free. But the Egyptians refused to let them go. So God began to send plagues upon Israel, or I'm sorry, upon Egypt, except for one place, Goshen. They had healthy cattle, they had healthy crops, the hail didn't fall there, the gnats didn't go there, the frogs didn't go there, the flies didn't go there. Why? Because their land was healed. Sickness didn't go there, the death didn't go there. See, this means a corporate atmosphere of healing. Literally in the Hebrew, this word is Rapha Erez, and it means to cure to totality of creation. Now I want you to let that sink in, to cure totality of creation. How many of you are part of creation? 
Only half of you. Ooh, boy, we got, we, I thought we were way better off than this, Pastor Ricardo. I said, how many of y'all are part of God's creation? Yeah. All right. The totality of creation. So when God says healing the land, that includes you. Are you hearing me? I have said before, this impending revival that I see coming, I believe is a revival of healing because I believe it is in God's nature and it's God's desire to bring healing to his people. We don't have to suffer the plagues like the world does. He will heal the land. Can you imagine a people that hunger and thirst for God in such a way that their garden does not produce the toxins like their neighbor does? Can you imagine a people so hungry for God and so desperate for his presence to where their cattle does not need all the additives in order to grow big and strong? Can you imagine an atmosphere so set with the presence of God that even if somebody puts toxins in our food to destroy our bodies, that it'll be eliminated before it gets to the places that it can bring harm. The Bible does say in Mark chapter 16 that you shall drink poison and it will not harm you. We may not drink it, but a lot of us eat it, sometimes unaware. We do the best we can to eat healthy, but then we trust God. He will heal the land. Can you imagine an atmosphere so natural for healing that the only way not to get healed is to reject it? It says Jesus couldn't perform miracles in his own hometown because the people rejected it. Everywhere Jesus went, people were getting healed. And how many times does it say, and he healed them all? Can you imagine an atmosphere so set for that that people walk in with cancer and the cells start just dying as soon as they walk in the room? Can you imagine people with lung problems, breathing problems, all sorts of different health problems, all of a sudden those things? Can you imagine people struggling with weight, trying to get it off supernaturally, all of a sudden they just begin to lose weight like never before? Can you imagine metal rods all of a sudden being replaced with bone? Can you imagine things that you've done to your body to damage it that now you're committed not to do those things anymore being reversed? Your lungs healing themselves from years of smoking because you turned from your evil ways, because you humbled yourself, because you sought his face, and you, forget, and you, you prayed. I'll get there. I'll get some music. Can you imagine crime going down in our community? Can you imagine the clubs not being open? Because ain't nobody going no more. There's a church in Litchfield. What's it called, Becky? Restoration Church. They're meeting in a former club. Ah! I can see that happening due to necessity. Not due because the club went bankrupt and they quit. I can see clubs closing down and becoming churches because they ain't got no choice. Can you imagine an atmosphere where businesses can't even open on Sunday because ain't nobody going because their God's doing so much in this community. Forgive me for believing God's word. Forgive me for believing that if I do the if, he will do the then. What would happen if we set a corporate atmosphere where we all committed to the if? Does God have a choice but to do the then? God will not violate his word. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then revival is guaranteed. We can take the word impending right off. The question is, are we willing? The sin of Achan held up the entire Israeli army. They were superior because they had God on their side, but they were losing the battle because one person. Now, I'm not saying that one person sitting in a church, because if that's the case, then we're doomed. But what I am saying is people operating in unity 
and saying, God, we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We give thanks to you and we bless your name for the Lord is good and your mercy endures through all generations. And Lord, I am part of those generations. I am part of your creation and I'm believing that you are going to hear my voice. You're going to forgive my sin and you're going to heal the land. God, you're going to bring the church back together again. And you are going to, in these last days, bring forth a move like you promised when it said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on my handmaidens and my servants. Shall I pour out all of my spirit? I want to ask you to stand. See, all of this is possible. Because of one man, and his name is Jesus. And if you surrender your whole being to him, he will change everything. If you give your life to him right now, I'm going to ask the ministers to come right now. If you will give your life to him and say, Lord, I lay myself before you, and I humble myself. And Lord, I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to pray to you. And I'm going to turn from my evil ways. Lord, these things that are trying to hold on to me are not worth it. Everybody say, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. There ain't nothing worth going to hell over. And there ain't nothing worth living like hell on this planet. It is time for the church to repent. It is time for God's people to turn from their evil ways. It is time for God to heal the land. And I'm here to tell you that it can happen right now if you will respond. So are you ready? And see, I want to make this easy on some of you to say, well, I, I don't want people to know that I'm struggling. I don't want... Because I want to ask everyone who would say, I am willing, I am willing to humble myself, I am willing to seek God's face, I am willing to pray, and I am willing to turn from my wicked ways, I'm going to ask you to come. If some of you want specific prayer, we've got a row of ministers here right now that will pray with you right at this moment. Doesn't mean anything's wrong with you, doesn't mean your life is falling apart, doesn't mean you're in any desperate sin, it just means you need somebody to make contact with you. I'm willing to turn from my wicked ways. I'm willing to change my life. I'm willing to do what God has asked me to do. I just want you to come. Jesus. Some of you God wants to deliver right now. See, when I got saved, something happened. It doesn't happen to everybody. But all these evil desires that I had at that time just dropped off. I was delivered from drugs. I was delivered from alcohol. I was delivered from several different addictions. Now look, over time we go through seasons and we go through times where the enemy tries to latch back on and we have to resist. And we have to repent. But I believe there are some things some of you have been struggling with for years. And God, right now, at this moment, wants to set you free if you'll respond. Again, ministers all across the way willing to pray for you. Just ask you to come. Don't be afraid. Don't be bashful. Don't act like you're going to get judged. But I'm going to ask you to come. Do we really want revival? Then it's time. Yeah, no, 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 no. Jealous of me. Go ahead, brother. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. Realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections 
are for me. And oh, how He loves us so. Oh, how He loves us. talking about the, the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The thing about a shadow is you've got to be close. The, the thing about a campfire, how many of y'all, y'all like sat around a campfire? Amen. But to feel the heat, you've got to be close. Amen. And you know what Pastor Tim shared earlier was talking about fire brings new growth. You know, a lot of times, you know, we, we hate to see fire, but there, there can be good come out of fire. Amen. And being close to God, you know, sometimes he puts you in the fire and just to burn out the stuff. And there's some of you, you're resisting Pastor Tim's call today. Today's the day. I'm telling you, today's the day. Yes. Just one more time, come. You say, I'm willing. I'm willing to humble myself. I'm willing to seek his face. I'm willing to pray. And ultimately, I'm willing to turn from my wicked ways. Just come. that's watching on YouTube this morning. Maybe you'll watch it later. And I just want you to know that although you may not be corporately at this gathering, that God can use this word to penetrate your heart, to penetrate your life. While God is mysterious, while God is awe-inspiring, God's not real complicated. All He wants is you. 
maybe you don't have a church home and you live in the Elizabethtown area. And maybe you live in another area. There are, there are Bible-believing churches all over this country. But I just want to encourage you to come to the Lord now while He can be found. There is going to come a day when people are going to want Him and it's going to be too late. There are people in hell right now that want Jesus. But it's too late. Don't wait until it's too late. The Bible says, seek the Lord while He may be found. So Lord, I want to seek you while you can be found. I love you. open for those that want to continue but I'm going to step down off the stage just a couple of announcements this evening at five o'clock is our department head leaders meeting please if you're a department head make sure you're there also at 6 p.m. we will have our men's and our women's meeting I believe there is something about men and women coming together in unity that is beautiful to God